I really believe, uh, and the principle tells us that there is an evil force in the world, right? There's an evil force in the world that does not want the truth to get out. All right? We have to disabuse ourselves of any notion that everything is based in the physical world. That so much is indeed coming from the spiritual world. Again, this was really hard to put together. And I think it's because of that. Because there is a Satan. There's a real evil entity in the world that does not want the truth to be on this planet. And we have to strive with everything we've got against that evil force. I hope this is good. I hope you get something out of this. I hope you see my big view. I feel like Moses sometimes. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I can't speak. <laughs> but I'm asked to, I volunteered actually to do this. I've been so disturbed lately about what's going on in the world, this radical lurch to the left, that something has to be done. Someone has got to say enough is enough. Heads are being cut off. People are being burned alive. People are being dunked. Did you see what happened a couple of weeks ago? ISIS put five men into a cage and submerged them and drowned them. It's happening on a regular basis. And it's because of the leftward lurch of the world. It's satanic ideology, Luciferian ideology. I'm going to do my best to draw the contrast between the French Revolution, what happened at the French Revolution, and what's going on right now in the United States of America. The French Revolution and today. Anywhere in the principle, we always start with the nature of God. You have to start with the nature of God. To understand anything, we have to understand the essential nature of God. We know God is a harmonized being of masculinity and femininity. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his image, created he them. Male and female created he them. There's no way to pretzel that into anything else other than what it says. God is not an old man with a beard throwing lightning bolts down from heaven. Never happened, doesn't happen now, never will. God is the harmonized being of all that is masculine, all that is feminine. The harmonized being of positivity and negativity. That light, that light, that fan does not come on without the interrelationship between positive and negative charges. It's an absolute universal principle. Can't get around it. And God is a harmonized being of internal character, intellect, emotion, and will, or heart, and external form, the created world. Yeah. Very important. We have to start from basics. Who is God? What is reality? The original nature of humanity. Original nature should have been following an internal or sung-sung aspect, vertical aspect between man and his creator. And the external world, the external created world would serve man, man would serve that external world, the external world would serve man. Everything. I could go on forever about the interrelationship between man and creation. The classic example is the relationship between us and plants. Plants give off oxygen, which we absolutely must have to live. O2. We give off what? Carbon dioxide, CO2, a poison. Hello? We bring in <laughs> something nice, we give out something horrible to the trees. They love it, and they give us right back what a an interesting symbiosis between ourselves and creation. But that's the way God set it up. And that's just one of a thousand different examples. Walk down your local grocery store and look at the different types of fruits and vegetables, nuts, meats, everything. Where they, when they're, the Hubble telescope has looked millions of light years into every direction from our Earth and can't find anything even remotely like this planet. There's not a walnut out there, right? So, in the original nature of humanity, we should be following two tracks. An internal sung song track, invisible track, and an external hyung song track. Now, because of the fall, because of the fall, now we have these things. Religion, faith, duty, piety. Without the fall, would we have religion? No. no. You wouldn't need a church. What do you need a church for? Do you need a church to talk to your father? Do you have to make a sacrificial offering to your dad? Do you need faith that your parents love you? No, it will be an automatic process. But because of the fall of man, 
Now we pursue this sung song aspect. We have to have religion, something to rebind. Religios is to rebind man with God. Faith, duty, piety, these things we pursue. These things would be automatic outside of the fall. We wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be giving this lecture outside the fall. And externally, we pursue science, reason, rights, individuality. In the kingdom of heaven, we'd have absolute happiness, unfettered happiness and joy, and everything would work exactly as it's supposed to. But as it is, we know. Pick up a paper, <laughs> if you have any doubts. Pick up a paper, turn on the TV, you have hell on earth. So the original nature of humanity, I'm going to do a lot of cutting and pasting because in talking about the French Revolution, it wasn't until I started studying this, I realized how unbelievably complex and convoluted it really was. Wow, I got carpal tunnel syndrome. I, I, I took a brace off. Just searching for all this stuff, I have incredible pain in my arm. <laughs> There's so much to it. I had to boil it down to, to, to real basics. So, to abbreviate, the original nature of humanity, Sung Song, the, because of the fall, we have an Abel and Cain aspect now. Without the fall, we wouldn't even have Cain and Abel. But we have an Abel aspect, which historically went into Hebraism, into Judaic culture, and then from Hebraism into the Reformation and Christianity. And on the other side, the Cain aspect, or Young Song aspect, Hellenism, Roman Empire, Greco-Roman culture, uh, the, the flowering of culture, Cicero, Socrates, all the great thinkers, transportation, the Roman Empire, etc., which eventually gave birth to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Today, we're going to talk about those two guys right there, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. I hope you like it. If you don't, that's okay too. So, preparation for the second coming in our 400 years lecture talks about the Renaissance, a revival of ancient Greek classics, a respect for reason and science. Hellenism develops to assist human, but not religious concerns and humanism. Artists, philosophers such as Da Vinci, Erasmus, and Michelangelo emerge at this time. This is a representation of one of the dominant theories of the time was the geocentric view of the universe. In other words, the earth was the center of the universe. And the church propagated this idea based on the Bible. This is a, a cartography by Bartolomeu Veil, who is a Portuguese cartographer in 1568. Here's the earth in the center and all the planets <laughs> revolving around the earth. And this was the commonly held preeminent view of the time. From about 1650 to 1800, Europe and the New World experienced an enlightenment that introduced new paradigms of morality. This too was a period of discovery, but is generally limited to the realm of science, mathematics, and technology. Logic and reason reigned as thinkers became convinced that society and the natural world were like a giant united machine that, while complicated, could eventually be dismantled, studied, and mastered. The scientific method, which rely on the notion of objective observation leading to verifiable conclusions, spurred developments in astronomy, philosophy, medicine, and physiology, transportation, chemistry, and ethics. Empirical data suddenly displaced people's superstitious notions of how the world functioned by explaining mystical phenomena such as lightning, eclipses, disease, or hallucinations. People attributed simple things like lightning to the anger of God. Yeah. It's actually a, a physical process of, of, light, of, of electrical charges in the atmosphere, really. But until we could understand that, they were very scary things that nobody knew how to explain. The new authority in this part of the world was research and science, rather than the church and God. Isaac Newton, Galileo Galilei, and later Charles Darwin and many others are associated with the new fields of science, such as calculus, cosmology, and physics. Galileo was an Italian mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher who played a major role in the scientific revolution. His achievements include improvements to the telescope and consequent astronomical observations and support for Copernicanism. Society valued truth and the acquisition of knowledge as worthwhile pursuits that informed philosophy. Ethical behavior to treat everyone fairly was described in treatises by, among others, Thomas Hobbes and Baruch Spinoza. During this period, 
is an absolute explosion of ideas. And like I said, there's just no way to get them all in here. I had to take a, a couple of select uh, examples uh, to, to show. On April 12, 1633, Chief Inquisitor Father Vincenzo Michelano de Frenzola, appointed by Pope Urban VIII, began the Inquisition of Galileo Galilei for holding the belief that the Earth revolves around the Sun, <laughs> which was deemed heretical by the Catholic Church. <clears throat> On June 22, Galileo was convicted of heresy and spent the rest of his life under house arrest until his death in 1642. This just, I'm, I'm making a foundation to help you understand what was the prevalent thinking of the time. It's really important to figure out what happened in the French Revolution. A heliocentric universe was first proposed by Aristarchus of Samos in the third century BC. He had no way to measure this though. He had no way to prove it. He just felt like, I just know this is not working like that and it works like this. But with modern methods of measurement and astronomical instruments, Nicholas Copernicus had verified these findings and published his results in his Commentariolus in 1512. Out of fear of the church, however, <laughs> his final work, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, was never published until 1543 and only officially recognized by the church in the mid-1800s. <laughs> wow, are we dragging our heels. Add to this the already well-known history of the Inquisition beginning in France in the 12th century and expanding to Spain, Portugal, and even the Americas, resulting in the Peruvian and Mexican Inquisition. Conditions are percolating underneath history for a major explosion somewhere. Excusez-moi. And that explosion occurs in the 18th century France with the installation of Louis XVI as King of France. Born in 1754, Louis Auguste, 1765, becomes the heir to the throne upon, of France upon his father's death. He becomes what's called the Dauphin, the, the, the heir apparent to the throne of France. Doesn't assume the throne right away. 1770, marries Austrian Archduchess Marie Antonia, later known as Marie Antoinette, and in 1774, assumes the throne at 20 years of age. <laughs> wow. To, to assume the throne of France at this time, I have a great uh, video that was put out by the, hist by the History Channel. I saw this on TV and I was so blown away by it. I went on Amazon immediately and I bought it. Because it was it's so shocking. And I, I watched it again in preparation for this. Um, it, it, it goes into great detail. I'd say a third of it is just on the life of Louis XVI because it's so interesting and so weird. But again, in the interest of time, I just can't flesh it out uh, like I'd like to. In 1778 with Benjamin Franklin, he signs the Treaty of Amity and Commerce with the United States and the Treaty of Alliance to assist the United States in its fight with Britain, eventually nearly bankrupting France. So these things are percolating again France is about ready to blow. This is like <laughs> the straw that breaks the camel's back. In France, the country's near bankruptcy is as a result of assisting the United States with its war with Britain. Years of bad harvest also have inflamed popular resentment of the privileges enjoyed by the clergy and the aristocracy. Pressure on the government builds to a breaking point and King Louis XVI convenes <coughs> Le Excellent. <laughs> in May of 1789. May, remember, May of 1780. So much happens in 1789. In America, the Constitution of the United States is being ratified. On the Abel side. On the Cain side, this is happening. The Estates General of France. The third estate was considered the commoners. 98% of the people were considered commoners and the third estate. Second estate was the nobility, the one percent, and the one percenters. You ain't kidding. What have you just heard in the last couple of years about the what percenters? The one percent of the Occupy movement. This is the resurrection of the French Revolution in America today. This is just a small part of it, too. The same thing applied. This is why I say the French Revolution and today. It's identical. And I'm not the only one saying this. You can Google French Revolution and today, there's already thousands of people already talking about this. There's a direct parallel between what happened 
in 18th century France and what's happening in America today. So, under liberty, equality, and fraternity, <laughs> enter Maximilien Robespierre. Influences were Rousseau. Any, basically, Rousseau said pretty much anything goes. <laughs> that was his big deal. Descartes shifted the authoritative guarantee of truth from God to humanity. Descartes started out a staunch Catholic, a very deeply believing Catholic. While the traditional concept of truth implies an external authority, certainty instead relies on the judgment of the individual. He's basically taking the authority of absolute truth from God and bringing it down to earth. What did Satan do? <laughs> Same thing. Revelation 12.9. Man, in a man-centered revolution, the human being is now raised to the level of a subject, an agent, an emancipated being equipped with autonomous reason. This was a revolutionary step that posed the basis of modernity, the repercussions of which are still ongoing. The emancipation of humanity from Christian revelational truth and church doctrine, a person who makes his own law and takes his own stand. Again, one of the formulators of the French Revolution uh, and which eventually became materialism, communism, Marxism, Leninism. He was one of the leaders of the Jacobin Club. The Jacobin Club started out in a very, very noble way. The rights of man, intellectual salons, people, uh, salons uh, erupting all over France where people, intellectuals would gather and drink and talk about the, the wild new ideas coming in, discussing people like Rousseau and Descartes and the, the thinkers that had gone before them. It turned into a butcher's club. Strongly advocated for the Declaration of the Rights of Man adopted in 1789. And he was dubbed the incorruptible. He was so honored, and people thought of him so highly because of his, his staunch advocacy for the common man, the common worker, the rights of man. And he was instrumental in uh, drafting the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which Thomas, Ed, uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson actually uh, uh, assisted with. So, wait, oh, that was quick. <laughs> Bang. Jean-Paul Marat. Again, there's so many central figures that figure into the French Revolution, there's just too many. But there are some really notable uh, henchmen, shall we say, and this is one of them. Physician, theorist, and radical journalist, considered the most radical of the voices of, of the Revolution. And he said to his Jacobin club, I have a truth to tell you. You do not know your most deadly enemies. They are the constitutional priests. It is they who protest most in the provinces against Anarchists? Who wouldn't want to protest against an anarchist? You dig an anarchist? Yeah. Disorganizers, Dantonism, Rose Pierreism, Jacobinism. He loves all this stuff. Do not cherish any longer the popular errors. Cut at the roots of superstition. Declare openly that the priests are your enemies. What are we seeing in American culture today? An absolute, all out frontal assault on religious belief. Doesn't make a difference, Christian, Jew, Buddhist mostly Christians. Christians are really getting the brunt of a, of a, of a vicious uh, anti-Christian sentiment sweeping the land right now. Atheism is really on the march. The interesting thing about that though is in the scientific world atheism is being pounded back really really hard. With the discovery of the Higgs boson, dark matter, scientists are saying now 96 percent of the universe is dark matter and they don't know what it is. They can't identify it. And science is reaching a cul-de-sac from which they will not be able to emerge. They're going to have to acknowledge a universal prime force at some point. I use that term whenever I'm blogging on the web. I always, when I'm talking with atheists, I say, what about a universal prime force? It gets their attention. Universal prime at the base beyond atomic structure force, invisible. Not, not Jesus, not Buddha, not Muhammad. Universal prime force that perhaps has many ways of expressing itself. Hello? Georges Danton was a politician and chief force in the overthrow of the monarchy. He really advocated getting rid of Louis the Sixteenth. And Camille Desmoulins? Desmoulins. Les. Really? L-I-N-S. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's French. <laughs> I defer. 
childhood friend of Robespierre. He grew up with uh, uh, Robespierre. <coughs> And these three guys basically were the, one of the, uh, the set of some of the major architects of the French Revolution and what became the very violent aspect of the French Revolution. Back to the States General. Now, results of the convocation do not satisfy the commoners, and the Third Estate takes control of government. Third Estate, commoners, 98%, Occupy movement. <laughs> they stormed the Bastille, July 14th, remember? Which, uh, the, the State General was uh, convened in, in May. In July, the Bastille stormed and ransacked on July 14, 1789, and weapons taken. This is the repository of the weaponry for the French army and a prison as well, which symbolized for the people of France the despotism of the leadership. People were imprisoned for their ideas and uh, tortured there, actually. And uh, so there's the Bastille. It's then dismantled brick by brick by the Third Estate. See the parapets here? <laughs> here, they're going away. They actually uh, uh, went to the top of it and started dismantling it brick by brick and throwing the bricks into the street. Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Pronunciation? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Passed by France's National Constituent Assembly in August of August of 1789 is a fundamental document of the French Revolution and in the history of human and civil rights, a declaration of the rights of man. In America, it's interesting. There's the United States Declaration and the Constitution are being uh, uh, put together. On, on, and in fact, that's why I'm not bringing that up so much because I'm really focusing on the Cain side, the French Revolution. But at the, at the same time, on the able side, the United States is forming, a constitution is formed, uh, and uh, the revolution is beginning. The Declaration was directly influenced by Thomas Jefferson working with General Lafayette, who introduced it. Influenced also by the doctrine of natural right, the rights of man are held to be universal, valid at all times and every place pertaining to human nature itself. It became the basis for a nation of free individuals protected equally by law, inspired in part by the American Revolution. This is 1789. The American Revolution happened in 1776. Right? And also by Enlightenment philosophers, the Declaration was a core statement of the values of the French Revolution had a major impact on the development of liberty and democracy in Europe and worldwide. But at the time, the Revolution was completely and utterly subverted and corrupted by just out-and-out -out selfishness. At the time, beheading in France, when people were punished, generally, uh, it was done by axe or sword, which did not always cause immediate death. Also, only the nobility were beheaded. The nobility got a merciful death. Just real quick, whack, and off they went. But the commoners were hung, and probably many times with not great effect, like hanging there for a while. And <laughs> on October 10, 1789, during a discussion on capital punishment with the leaders of the General Assembly, Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotine suggested his now famous machine as a means of the most merciful and painless death possible. They had to do a lot of killing. Jean-Paul Marat especially famously said, I believe in the cutting off of heads. He felt if the revolution wasn't going right, we're not cutting off enough heads. He actually said that. We're not cutting off enough heads. I think they did 800 in a week or something like that. Some horrendous amount. From September 5th, 1793 to July 28th, 1794 is historically named the Reign of Terror. The French Revolution gives birth to the Reign of Terror. From fraternity, equality, and liberty to this in a matter of years. 16,594 died by the guillotine, 2,600 in Paris alone, and another 25,000 in summary executions across the country. A, a, a bloodbath. Absolute madness. As Jean-Paul Marat and Rose Pierre tried to consolidate power and, and gain dictatorial control over the country. The French revolutionaries politicized every aspect of life. In Paris, 1,400 streets were renamed because the old ones referred to a king, queen, or a saint. In the movie, uh, the, the presentation from the History Channel, it shows some of the street names, and they actually pull, it, it referred to anything, 
king, queen, saint, religious uh, reference, it was pulled down. Notre Dame Cathedral became the temple of reason. In the Soviet Union, after the Bolshevik Revolution, St. Basil's Cathedral became the Museum of Atheism in 1918. And stayed that way for quite a while until the Soviet Union fell. Montmartre became Mont Marat. <laughs> Jean-Paul Marat. Uh, there's, there's so much to this, you just can't... can't it's, it's really a fascinating study. I really encourage people to study the French Revolution. It's, it's, it's really something. Like I say, in the interest of time, I've got to cut it down. Because <laughs> there's so much, though. Language changed, too. The queen bee became a laying bee. What's happening in our culture today? There are certain things you can't even say anymore. In 1794, a delegation petitioned to abolish VU, as a result of which there will be less pride, less discrimination, and a stronger leaning towards fraternity. Letters had to be ended with greetings and brotherhood rather than your most humble and obedient servant. That's how bad it gets. That's how bad it's getting in America, and you know it. Christian Holy Days were changed to celebrate new revolutionary values. November 22nd, formerly St. Cecilia's Day, became Day of the Turnip. Day of the turnip, man. Go turn it. No. People renamed themselves. It wouldn't do to be called Louis in 1794. Oh, better to be Brutus. Yeah. Children were given new names too. Many of them drawn from nature. Please. Peace on Lee. The dandelion became popular for girls. This is what happens to culture, even language. Watch your language. It's going away. Months were changed. Forget January. Anything even resembling anything like the Gregorian calendar, anything related to the Catholic Church, your January becomes this, <laughs> February. <laughs> even the months were renamed. They're trying to stamp out any vestige whatsoever of the religion that was the foundation for France for we don't know how long. It was a Catholic country for the longest time. Weeks were changed too. Instead of four seven-day weeks in a month, we now have a 10-day week with Sunday eliminated. It now becomes a criminal offense to close a shop on what was considered Sunday. Here they are. Here's our little rogues gallery here. Georges Danton, Jean-Paul Marat, Camille Desmoulets. <laughs> this gourd... Uh, I, I can't remember when this was discovered. Danton, Marat, de Moulet. And there's their images. You know what's inside that gourd? After Louis XVI was decapitated, they put handkerchiefs in the blood and then put it inside this gourd and then painted these images on there. That's how proud they were. And they did a DNA test re recently and it was indeed Louis XVI's blood. The, the uh, handkerchief had disintegrated long ago, but there were still vestiges in there. Okay. All that remains of the Bastille <laughs> is one little footprint of a turret. That's it. And this is all Robespierre gets. <laughs> a very badly placed subway sign Hey, Francois, where should we put the metro sign? Ah, uh, just nail it right in the middle of his name. <laughs> That's what you get, Robespierre. Every single statue of Robespierre has been taken down in France. He's persona non grata, but it took 100 years for him to do it. So, there you go. From the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, the Cain type view of life. Descartes, rationalism, Locke, empiricism, deism, Herbert, denial of revelations, miracles. You, our culture is getting saturated with this. Go anywhere, pick up any paper, do a search on the web. Left-wing Hegelianism, Strauss, Furbach. These kind of ideas took root in this period. And to the present day. Excuse-moi. Ou la oui. Present day. 
David Horowitz spent the first part of his life in the world of the communist progressive left, a politics he inherited from his mother and father, and later in the new left as one of its founders. When the wreckage he and his comrades had created became clear to him in the mid-70s, he left. Three decades of second thoughts then made him this movement's principal intellectual antagonist. For better or worse, as Horowitz writes in the preface to this, the first volume is collected conservative writings, I have been condemned to spend the rest of my days attempting to understand how the left pursues the agendas from which I have separated myself and why. There's a bomb thrower with Tom Hayden in the 60s. Someone killed a friend of one of the Black Panthers, killed one of his friends, and he took a hard <laughs> turn to the right after that. This book is absolutely hair-raising, 101 of the most dangerous academics in America. Do you know who these people are? Venture a guess? Well, they're co-founders of the Weather Underground, a 60s violent radical organization. That's Bill Ayers. Implicated in many bombings, New York City Police Headquarters, San Francisco Police Headquarters, U.S. State Department, and many, many other places. They've never been able to nail this guy, but he's never denied it, and the police, any of the police uh, functions uh, are absolutely convinced he did it. They just, it's like O.J. Simpson. We just, we just don't have the knife. We don't have the... <laughs> We don't have film, <laughs> unfortunately. And this is his wife, Bernadine Dorn. She was jailed for seven months for refusing to testify in a Brinks robbery in 1981 and was on the FBI's most wanted list for three years. Barack Obama launched his campaign for Senate from their living room in Chicago. Little known fact. Where are they now? You think they're, maybe they're in jail. They should be in jail, right? A bombing in... They're tenured professors at the University of Illinois in Chicago, both of them. Unbelievable. These are the people that are teaching your kids. Ward Churchill, he's another winner. Professor of Ethnic Studies, University of Colorado at Boulder. The artificial Indian. He claimed Indian heritage, and it turned out to be an absolute abject lie. And this is what he wrote. From some people pushed back on the justice of roosting chickens. That's a couple days after 9-11 attacks. More likely, it was because they were too busy braying. Braying, donkeys go bray. Ah. Incessantly and self-importantly into their cell phones, arranging power lunches and stock transactions, each of which translated conveniently out of sight, mind, and smelling distance into the starved and rotting flesh of infants. If there was a better, more effective, or an, in fact, any other way of visiting some penalty befitting their participation upon the little Eichmanns, inhabiting the sterile sanctuary of the Twin Towers, I'd really be interested in hearing about it. In other words, it's not a punishment fitting enough for them. Eichmann's. Eichmann was the, was he propaganda minister for Adolf Hitler? Oh, yeah, that's right. Go, go, uh, Goebbels was the, uh, but Eichmann was uh, a, f a, a main functionary of the Nazi regime. And he was fired because of it. It took him a while. But and he sued and countersued, and they gave him a dollar and fired him. Little Eichmanns, <laughs> people going to work, clacking away on computers, trying to feed their families. But this is the level of vitriol, the, the kind of socialism, leftism that's creeping into our culture. Paul, or Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So, Paul is saying there are seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're floating around out there, and we have to be wary of them. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Matthew 24, there shall arise false Christ, false prophets shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Who in the world are the very elect? It would seem to me the very elect would be the ones that see the second coming of Christ, or the ones that are lined up to receive the Messiah. That's us. We are susceptible. We're a target. And we shouldn't be deceived. 
We now see the same mentality reproduced now in the politically correct movement. Seasoned CBS reporter Cheryl Atkinson, she's been 30 years in journalism and was a CBS reporter. She's been electronically surveilled while digging deep into the Obama administration and the scandals and offers an incisive critique of her industry and the shrinking role of investigative journalism in today's media. When someone like this writes a book like this, there's something going on. There's something behind it. It takes a lot to, to make liberal people turn against their own. It takes an act of almighty God. Americans are at the mercy of powerful figures in business and government who are virtually unaccountable. The Obama administration in particular has been broken new ground in its monitoring of general journalists, intimidation and harassment of opposition groups, and surveillance of private citizens. I did not go into detail about what happened in the French Revolution. There were situations set up throughout France where people would inform on each other. If you didn't like somebody and you wanted to see them get their heads cut off, all you got to do is say, he's against the regime. I heard him plotting against the government. That's all you got to do. And there was a certain point at that one year, the reign of terror, where people were informing on each other like that. If you just wanted to get rid of somebody, if you can make a strong enough case, you can make them go away. Lifelong liberal Kirsten Powers blasts the left's force march. Totally liberal, Democrat, registered Democrat, voted for Obama, blasts the left's forced march towards conformity in an expose of the illiberal war on free speech. No longer champions of tolerance and free speech, the illiberal left now viciously attacks and silences anyone with alternative points of view. Powers asks, whatever happened to free speech in America? You, again, this is another search you can do on the web where uh, there's one case where a, a history teacher forced his entire class to walk an American flag as an artistic expression of some sort. I think he was fired as well. I mean, <laughs> enough, enough people got angry to get rid of him. But those kind of things are commonplace now. Commonplace. This whole Renaissance, uh, ref, uh, 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 Revolutionary War uh, kind of thinking is uh, even uh, going into the, into the college area now. The Washington Post, September 16th, this is about two months before the election, 2014, said they have a 51% chance of holding the Senate. Here's what actually happened. <laughs> the election saw sweeping gains by the Republican Party in the Senate, House, and numerous uh, races. It just goes on and tells you the absolute scorched earth of that election. The, and there's two points here. One is the corruption of media. It was an absolute rout. There is no way the media could have possibly missed this, except they're trying to influence the outcome. There's no other way to understand it. Benjamin Netanyahu. How did Netanyahu score such a decisive election victory? These are three elections I'm going to talk about that happened in rapid succession. In some ways, it was very reminiscent of the same hour 19 years ago when we realized that those who had gone to sleep with Prime Minister Sh Sh Shimon Peres, who was the Prime Minister at the time, were about to wake up to Prime Minister Net Benjamin Netanyahu. Only then, the shift was by a fraction of a decimal point. Last night, huge chunks of votes moved from column to column as the dead heat between Likud and the Zionist Union, as surprising and near unimaginable as it had been earlier in the evening, was developing into a rout of almost landslide proportions. Everyone, if you read the newspapers prior to that election, everyone was saying Netanyahu doesn't have a chance. He's dead man walking. No one in his immediate circle, and certainly none of the senior Likud figures who on Tuesday were planning their moves in a post bb era, expected anything near this result. The most that any of them had dared to hope for was the closing of the gap which had opened the previous week between Zionist Union and Likud. Or had it? Which of the polls, if any, that we were inundated over the last few months can we believe now? This is from Haaretz. Haaretz is a left-wing anti-Netanyahu newspaper. This is not some right-wing rag. This is a paper that hates him, and they have to, they have to admit what's going on. <coughs> David Cameron's election in, in England. Nobody had him winning. Dead man walking. 
Prime Minister David Cameron's Conservative Party defied the polls and won an outright majority of Parliament. Election results showed Friday. The party won 331 seats, enough to form a government without a coalition partner. A rout. The outcome defies months of polls forecasting a statistical dead heat between the two major parties, Conservative and Labor, with neither expected to win an outright majority, setting the stage for the country's second coalition government in a row. Something's going on. One, it's the, it's the infiltration of media, our very sources of information. And where do these people come from? News reporters, journalists, they come from the university system. We talked about the university system. And who's controlling it? David Horowitz did the definitive study on voter registration in the college system. 87% Democrat. You can barely get hired in a university now if you even smell like a conservative. The final tally for the 650-seat House of Commons shows the later party won 232 seats. Cameron's current coalition partner, the Liberal Democrats, all but collapsed, winning only eight seats. It previously held 57. Rout. Scorched earth. Rubio said on Capitol Hill, tried to prevent Netanyahu win by ordering operatives to Israel. President Obama sent top political advisors to Israel to influence the election's outcome and prevent Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's win, Florida uh, Senator Marco Rubio said. She's, Obama sent Jeremy Byrd and several other people and a lot of money to try to defeat Netanyahu to, to help uh, mobilize a center-left coalition that would be enough to overcome him in the election. This is serious business. Something's happening. We've got a French revolution going on in America. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ has done once, has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached into the spirits in prison. After Jesus died, the Bible says he went into hell, into prison, to try to liberate the spirits that were captive there. Here's where we are now. We have to watch our ideas. Watch, be, listen very, very carefully, especially college students. Be very careful in college what you listen to. It's, it's, the college system has really been taken over by the left, by atheists, socialists, people that, uh, that have absolutely no spiritual values whatsoever. You have to separate the wheat from the chaff. When you're learning something, learn what you gotta learn, but don't take everything. Now, I think this is one of the best pictures ever taken of <laughs> True Father. I love this picture. So Father is now, unfortunately, no longer with us. And I'm absolutely convinced that, like I said, there's two things going on. Number one, the subversion of the means of information in America. Number one, the college system. Number two, newspapers, radio, TV. But I'm absolutely convinced the only explanation for how those three elections turned out the way they did when everything said they wouldn't turn out that way, some young moon is working from the spirit world. Remember, he's in the spirit world now. He has no limitation whatsoever. There's no physical limitation. He, he doesn't have a, an old body that's hard to move around. He's not in a wheelchair, let me tell you. He probably looks like he's about 30 years old and he's down there kicking it. And you know where he's probably at? Where did Jesus go when he died? He went to hell. Gehenna. Why? Because he's a parent. Sun Young Moon is a parent. True Father is a parent. Where does he go first? To the ones that are suffering the most. The ones in the deepest part of hell. That stinky purple place that Hyung Jin talked about. And he's lifting it up. And I have a feeling, now this is pure speculation. I have no way to prove this. But I think Father said, wait a second, I got some elections to take care of. I'll be right back. <laughs> and he goes up, marshals his angels and all the, how many hundreds of millions of good spirits are available? What do you think they're doing? Knitting? 
Heck no, they're mobilized by the Messiah. And they have to affect things like this in the physical world. If everything goes off the end of the, of the earth, we're dead. So I believe that's just, this and 250 will get me on the bus, I understand that. But Father is actually working from the spiritual world to affect really important things in the physical world. Benjamin Netanyahu cannot lose that election. It's really important. Because now Iran is more than likely going to get a nuclear weapon. And they have promised to use it. They promised to use it. Cameron, England cannot go off the rails. They're one of the few true democracies left on earth. And in America, it was just a, an astounding reversal of the trend, the leftward trend of America in the, in the, in the 14 elections. I don't know what's going to happen in 16. I hope we've got a reprieve. I hope there's, some, there's something on the horizon. But now, Hak Jahan Moon, our true mother, is now the representative of Sun Young Moon. My feeling is she is the only North Star that we have left. Father's physical presence is no longer with us. Father designated her the representative of the Unification Church. The hope is we unite with her, we can save the country, we can save the world. Now, again, we talked about our workshop coming up. The reason why I, I, I sang Call for Reapers was by design. We're having a workshop on the first. This is really serious. People are getting their heads cut off. People are getting set on fire. ISIS is absolutely out of control. Four Marines shot dead in Chattanooga. I think a fifth uh, Navy chief just died. I've been predicting this for years, that there's going to be shootings like this. And um, I think it's going to get worse. And it's going to be van loads of people in multiple cities simultaneously. The only way to repel that is divine principle. The Republicans are not going to do it. The Democrats are certainly not going to do it. Independence, I'm sorry, political roadkill. We're having a, a workshop on the first. Please get people there. Take flyers. Put one in the back of your pocket. You never know. You just never know. You run into somebody and you're going to go, oh man, I w and it's happened to me. Even recently, I forgot to put a flyer in my pocket and I run into just incredible people. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Don't have anything to give them. Grab a flyer. Ladies, put it in your purse. Just fold it up. Um, now, there's cards in the back and there's paper in the front. There's like a hard card if you want something a little more substantial. But that's the answer, the hope. I gave you a real, real pessimistic scenario. But the hope is true father working in the spirit world, true mother in the physical world, and Unification Church members taking it seriously and getting people to that workshop talk to somebody. Share the divine principle. It's what changed your life. In the first generation, second gen, you didn't have the kind of conversion experience that first gen had. We just came out of nowhere. We were like doing dope or playing rock and roll or whatever. I was doing both, unfortunately. And, uh, and we had miraculous conversion experiences. A lot of you have been born into the movement. Help someone outside who knows nothing about divine principle and true parents uh, to have that kind of road to Damascus experience. And um, there you have it. That's, that's it. Thank you so much.